David Lynch, one of cinema's most experimental filmmakers. But why is Eraserhead still his most experimental work and also his most nightmarish? If you're willing to enter a unique realm of disturbance, follow me as I analyse 1977's Eraserhead. Even Lynch himself has openly talked about how a lot of the ideas within the film are ones he doesn't know the meaning of. He prefers the idea of an an abstract movie to be interpreted by whoever sees it, rather than telling them directly its core themes. With that being said, this episode of Nightmare Fuel is based on how I personally viewed it, and so I'd love to hear in the comments any of your ideas. And while down there, if you haven't already, a subscribe to the channel would be greatly appreciated to help us reach our next goal of 35k subs. Thanks in advance. Eraserhead's opening sequence immediately places you into something equally familiar and unfamiliar. We arrive in space with a moon-like planet orbiting amongst the stars, and that is something we understand. We also see a man in a suit, again, something we understand. But when both of these images are superimposed together and the man gives birth to a sperm-like creature from his mouth, Yep, this sets the pace for the madness to come. Eraserhead is a movie which continues to take place in locations which go right back to that combination of things being recognisable, but also not quite right, like there's something unnatural about them. This is particularly true in the home of the film's protagonist, Henry, played by Jack Nance. I identified within the confines of the film's setting, visuals and sound design that there is a constant battle between the natural and the unnatural, and the unnatural is winning the fight. Henry lives in an industrial location in an apartment complex. This place was inspired by Lynch's childhood living in Philadelphia, in a troubled neighbourhood with an atmosphere of violence, hate and filth. Well Dave, you've adapted that pretty accurately here. The whole area is made up of bricks and metal and concrete, while the soundtrack includes the chewing of trains and the clanging of metal. It all ties into being mechanical cold and lifeless. So when you factor in how the movie displays nature, you've got quite the dichotomy. Henry's apartment is filled with dead, or at least barely alive, vegetation. Mounds of what appear to be dead grass, a plant by his bed, which is just a dead twig and a mound of dry mud. It's like nature is still within that world, but it's dying and cannot bring itself back to life. I believe that the family of Henry's partner, Mary, helped to continue this idea through the character of Bill. He's a man who remembers the area being green pastures, significantly natural and full of colour and freedom. But now everything is pipework and built up. These materials have choked the life out of the area quickly. You can even see a large arrangement of flowers in Bill's house exaggerated in size, as though they're symbolically trying to compete with the amount of the unnatural in the house, such as a large black pipe just in the middle of the living space dominating the screen. Bill even tells a story of his left arm losing its feeling, so he gradually nursed it back into being able to feel before it went completely numb again. It had life, it lost life, it gained life again through nurturing, and then it lost life again. That constant battle between feeling something and feeling nothing at all. Even Henry's home has a bizarre cupboard on the wall with flowers painted onto it. He sees a vibrant energetic stage show within the metallic confines of a radiator. When looking out of his window, where many people would like to see the world outside, Henry is trapped by a brick wall, compressing the world around him, choking the life out of it. Going back to the sound design of the film, those sounds of clanging and machinery and hissing constantly do battle with the sounds of rain and wind, the crying of a child and puppies feeding on their mother. The sound design is in itself that very natural versus unnatural fight for dominance. It's black and white, just like the clothes of Henry, just like the checkered floor of the stage show, just like the movie itself. The lifeless black, the hopeful white, and the grey shades of their conflict all clashing in cinema. All of these little details connected with me in a way where I viewed Eraserhead as a war of life and death. 
it just so happens to be taking place in a seriously dread-inducing world. Honestly, this movie just makes me feel weird. I get this uncomfortable feeling whenever I view it, and there's so much packed into it that carries it into the upper echelons of surrealist cinema. Aesthetically, Arias Ahead exists in its own dimension of fright. In the introduction sequence, we witness a strange house on the planet, in itself bizarre, and within it we see a disfigured man staring out of the window. Just look at the state of this thing. Looks a bit like Tetsuo. His body is scarred and decrepit and he sits within this random room pulling levers that control the world Henry resides in. Is he a godlike figure? What relation does this planet house have to the rest of the film? To me this was possibly the most ambiguous piece to the puzzle here. Yet I found the man in the planet to be a shocking entity, one where the lack of clarity enhances the mystery. One thing we can note is that he is the one who pulls the lever which sends the weird spermy creature into a vat of, I presume, embryonic fluid? But these creatures, oh man. These are grade A cuts of nightmare fuel right here. Henry and Mary's baby look like a bloody premature birth dinosaur. Just acknowledge this. The practical effects are truly spellbinding here, but oh my days, the appearances throughout the film are great grotesque. There are pretty strong, yet unconfirmed rumours that this thing was brought to life using the fetus of a calf which had been embalmed, though Lynch has never confirmed how it was made or how he was able to articulate it. The baby is fed by Mary, but squelchingly spits and gargles its food back up, refusing to ingest it. When its temperature is tested by Henry, the baby winds up becoming suddenly sick, retching and straining, becoming covered in spots. It's horrible. But the baby terror doesn't stop here. The lady in the radiator who Henry sees stomps on multiple tiny replicas of the baby while dancing. She's a right clip herself with a puffed up cheeks and fixated overly happy expression. Seeing her stomp on these little wriggly things, coating the floor in goo, is one of the film's most memorable scenes to me and certainly one of its most graphic we get a baffling sidestep in the film's narrative. Henry is beheaded, his mannequin-like head now lying on the checkered tiles, while from his neck stump grows another of these snake-like creatures. The design is iconic, but it's also insanely off-putting, seeing the body of a fully grown adult male sprouting one of these things? But then we get even weirder when a kid picks up the disembodied head of Henry, now lying on the ground, and he takes takes it to a strange building which manufactures pencils, where the head of Henry is used to create an eraser. That's the double meaning of the film's title, his head is literally turned into an eraser. But for years, I thought it was because his hair sticks up so much it resembles an eraser. Am I the only one who thought that? In terms of the double meaning, I think it could tie into the erasing of life in the world, like the gradual erasing of plant life and of feelings, and the fact one end of a pencil can erase and one can create by being able to draw things is yet another dichotomy in this world. Let's get to the most graphic scene in the film. Now, this could have easily gone to the dinner scene with Mary's family where they eat a tiny chicken that comes to life and squirts out blood because that's certainly not a regular sight. But my standout stomach churning section in the film once again involves that bloody baby. Henry carves open its bandages with a pair of scissors and sorry, can't show this on screen, he unfolds them to reveal the baby's twitching organs, which Henry proceeds to stab with the scissors as they implode into mush. Mwah, beautiful. I'm looking at the punctured organs of an underdeveloped fetal alien. Oh, David Lynch, you've ruined my dreams. Lynch's daughter, Jennifer, was born with clubbed feet and had to undergo correctional surgery. She claims that part of the script was inspired by her father's fear of fatherhood and of the unforeseen complications that can come with childbirth. I can kind of see that in a mega abstract way. Henry is extremely distant as a father. Not physically, but he just becomes a stationary void of a man whenever it comes to needing to assist the baby. And I suppose shoving a pair of scissors into its exposed innards kind of fits with that argument too. Eraserhead is, as it always has been, a film which can 
can be interpreted infinitely. It's a baffling creation which can leave you with a deep feeling of unease, presenting you with a recognisable and unrecognisable world smashed together. I believe this is still Lynch's most experimental piece, a blend of a dream and a nightmare. It's nothing short of a frightening hour and a half experience. Do you agree? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you'd like to see more videos like this, consider turning on notifications by slapping the bell below, wherever we next meet. Thank you very much for your time to watch this analysis. I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, and I'll see you next time for another dose of Nightmare Fuel. Yeah.